And you talk to people that free dive and they, you know, they get all starry eyed and they're just like, oh, it's just amazing that you know, you'd be down there. And it's just when you're not a free diver, you're like, you're like, how can being underwater and drowning and suffocating be relaxing? Well, when you do it right, you don't feel like you're drowning. You don't feel like you're, you're just, you know, you're completely relaxed. You're weightless. It's, it's an unused, it's, it's not like anything else I've certainly ever done. And, you know, you talk to people that do it and they'll, they all swear by it. master's degree in physiology, biomechanics, and human nutrition. I've spent the past two decades competing in some of the most masochistic events on the planet, from seal fit Kokoro, Spartan Agoji, and the world's toughest mutter, to 13 Ironman triathlons, brutal bow hunts, adventure races, spearfishing, plant foraging, free diving, bodybuilding, and beyond. I combine this intense time in the trenches with a blend of ancestral wisdom and modern science, search the globe for the world's top experts in performance, fat loss, recovery, gut, hormones, brain, beauty, and brawn to deliver you this podcast everything you need to know to live an adventurous joyful and fulfilling life my name is ben greenfield enjoy the ride well hello i had a blast on today's episode with my buddy ted hardy talk about free diving and breath holding and spear fishing and a, a whole lot more even if you absolutely detest water there's some some very interesting takeaways in this particular show uh, now uh, a couple of quick things uh, this podcast is brought to you by Keon which is my playground for all things health and wellness. What I've done is created this company uh, to kind of scratch my own itch. Whenever I find a, a cool new ingredient or some brand new molecule that can make your life better, whether it's recovery or performance or digestion or fat loss or muscle gain or blood sugar control, you name it. I actually create these formulations. They're these shotgun formulations of supplements, functional foods, bars, coffees. Everything is over there. It's all research-backed. It's all real-world tested and designed to empower you to live a very fulfilling life, pain-free, operating with a brain and body that works the way it's supposed to. So you get 10% off of anything at Keon. Very simple. You go to getkeon.com. That's get K I O N dot com. And the discount code that you can use over at Keon is BGF10. So you go to getkeon.com, BGF10 saves you 10% site wide. How do you like that? This podcast is also brought to you by Juve. Juve is the giant red light panel that I use in my office. I pull down my pants, I walk in front of that thing, it increases my skin health, my collagen and elastin production, warms my joints up, reduces pain, reduces inflammation, causes this big nitric oxide flush for my whole body for if I'm going to go work out or maybe in the evening go make a little love. It also, speaking of making love, increases testosterone production, guys, if your balls get exposed to this thing. Not only that, but they have this brand new Juve Go, this Juve Go. It's this tiny little handheld device that you can take, as the name implies, anywhere on the go. Same medical grade power as the bigger Juve devices, but it's wireless, it's rechargeable, It's wonderful to have in your bag when you're traveling. I actually lay in bed at night reading Harry Potter with it tucked between my balls or on my stomach. There, I said it. Those are my two favorite ways to use the new Juve Go. You can get a nice little bonus gift with your Juve, any of their models, if you go to juve.com forward slash Ben. That's J-O-O-V-V dot com forward slash Ben and use code Ben at checkout. Hey folks, Uh, about two years ago, I wrote an article called How Breath Holding, Blood Doping, Shark Chasing, Free Diving, and Ketosis Can Activate Your Body's Most Primal Reflex. And I wrote that after I began to get involved with free diving and spearfishing, which I did when I discovered this book, uh, this this again was a couple years ago, by an author named James Nestor. The name of the book was Deep, uh, Freediving, Renegade Science, and What the Oceans Tell Us About Ourselves. It was a great book, and it, it got me so interested in this concept of freediving and spearfishing that I decided to hunt down uh, one of the best people in the U.S. to actually teach me 
how to do this. So I hired this guy named Ted Hardy, Ted Hardy from Immersion Free Diving in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, to certify me in free diving uh, so that I could then learn ha- how to spear fish uh, and also how to increase my breath hold, get better at, at equalizing underwater, be able to dive more than 15 feet, which I could never do in my life without getting ear pain, and I couldn't figure out how to equalize that depth. And so I hooked up with this guy named Ted Hardy. Uh, he's he's uh, six feet tall. He's, he's 230 pounds. He's like a big guy. He looks like a, like a boxer, not like a guy you'd expect to be diving at incredibly efficient oxygen capacity to depths deeper than most of us have ever gone. Uh, but he has cracked the code on this stuff. He opened up my eyes to a whole new world of free diving. I spent 96 hours of my life down in Florida getting trained by him in the classroom, in the pool, and eventually uh, in the ocean. And uh, Ted, what, what, what's most interesting about him is, A, he, he holds the record for hypoxic underwater swimming in the pool. He can do seven full lengths in the pool without a single breath, and he has anemia, which means his blood can't deliver oxygen as efficiently to his muscles and brain as most of the world's population. Uh, this means he has a relatively low blood hematocrit level, yet he's still figured out how to crack the code on free diving with a condition that would leave most folks huffing and puffing for air after they climb a flight of stairs. Uh, he's uh, was selected as the team captain for the U.S. free diving team at the Free Diving World Championships. Uh, he's also a, a scuba instructor. Uh, he, he's just his his wealth of knowledge is absolutely uh, staggering when it comes to everything to do with breath holding and free diving. Now, I interviewed him on the podcast uh, a couple of years ago, and we delved into everything from like uh, using static apnea tables to how cold and cold water could actually inhibit your ability to be able to hold your breath. Uh, we talked about his whole backstory, and today we're going to be diving into a lot, a lot more in terms of like the biology and the physiology of free diving, how to take bigger breaths, how to equalize properly. But if you want to hear Ted's whole backstory, because we're going to spend more time on the free diving component than the backstory component, then just go listen to my first podcast with Ted. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to link to that first podcast with Ted, and I'm also going to link to everything that we talk about on today's show if you just go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash free diving podcast that's ben greenfield fitness.com slash free diving podcast ted welcome to the show man oh, i'm excited to be on the show and uh excited to chat with you guys yeah for sure i mean like it, i i feel like i talk to you on a frequent basis because it seems like every time i've got like the tiniest question about spear fishing gear or or free diving or anything else you're you're just like an, an email away so we we tend to chat back and forth quite a bit but i figured it was high time i actually got you back on the show because uh well i'm i'm gonna be uh spear fishing next month down in kona and i know a lot of people are interested in this emerging kind of knowledge of of how good some of this stuff is for you and by the way if you're listening in and you just have no clue why the hell you'd want to get in the water and dive more than 15 feet and maybe grab a spear gun and go hunt after tasty fish uh we're we're gonna we're gonna fill you in on the show so actually ted i think that'd be a perfect kind of jumping off point here uh or or a a perfect uh topic to to dive into pun intended as we as we get going, uh, what what is it that happens to the body during during free diving? Like like why is it that this is this is something that you know like Olympic athletes are doing and people are now using to to enhance their their vagus nerve function? Like what what what's the deal with the the biological benefits of this? Well, I mean, free diving is you know I don't need to t- tell you it's it's exploding right now, right? I mean, it's getting super super popular. Uh, so more and more people are getting into free diving. Uh, we see, you know, almost all of the scuba agencies now are jumping on the free diving bandwagon because, I mean, free diving's it, it's awesome. So it does a lot of interesting things. Like yoga is super popular, and if you go to a, almost any yoga class, one of the first things they're going to do is they're going to alter how you breathe. 
And guess what we as freedivers do? We alter how we breathe. In fact, it's very similar to the breathing that we might do as a freediver is what you might do in yoga. So one of the first things my students notice is when I start teaching them the breathing we use for freediving, they go through the breathing pattern for like three minutes and everyone's like, wow, I feel great. I feel totally relaxed, right? Because, <laughs> because, it, because it works, right? So, you know, freediving is a uh, way to access, you know, all of that stuff in the water, in the ocean, you get a chance to see the marine life. And unlike scuba, you get to be actually a part of it, right? Because you're not this loud mechanical thing that's swimming through the water, you're actually free diving, holding your breath. And uh, it's, 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 it's a lot of fun. If it's something you've never tried, it's, it's that, you know, now it's easier than ever to get involved in the sport. Yeah. That's actually one of the things I like the most is, is I'll fish from a boat or I'll fish from the shore with a fly fishing rod or a reel. And you know, you're, you're kind of blind fishing. You, you're, you're, you're throwing your hook in there. You, you may or may not get a, a legal fish or, or a non catch and release fish that you could actually go home and cook up. And, and then you, you put on your wetsuit and you put on your mask and, and you dive into the water with an actual spear gun, and all of a sudden, you're down there in the coral. You have this amazing feeling of relaxation. All the worries of the world just slip away, and you're exercising. You're cold. You're holding your breath, so you're tapping into all the benefits that we're going to talk about when it comes to you know, the mammalian dive reflex, which I'm going to ask you about, and, and, and the spleen compression that happens when you, when you dive deep. But even if you don't get a fish... You feel amazing at the end of a couple hours of spearfishing just because you're you're looking at beautiful coral and seeing amazing nature and scenery and swimming with the fish that kind of swim up to you because you're not in your in your foreign looking scuba diving gear. And then it, when you do see a fish, let's say you see a big grouper that you want to go after, it's not like you're on the edge of the shore like blindly throwing the hook in, hoping that that fish is the one that bites. You just go and hunt that fish, which is, which is amazing. You, you hunt it, you get it, you bring it up to the surface or you put it on your stringer and, uh, and then you go home and have a fish cook. So, yeah, I mean, like it's for, for me, it's, it's just way, way better than, than regular fishing. Uh, but, but let's get into the physiology here. Uh, can you talk to me specifically, let, let's start off with the mammalian dive reflex. What is that? And why would we want to activate that? So the mammalian dive reflex is, you know, it's genetically coded in every human being on the planet. Dolphins, seals, and whales are mammals. We, as human beings, are mammals, right? So dolphins, seals, and whales are full-time residents of the water. We are part-time residents of the water. So dolphins, seals, and whales, one of the reasons they can dive so incredibly deep and do all these things that they can do it's because they have something called the mammalian dive reflex. And it's absolutely something that we have too. So one of the things that, you know, I or other instructors will do in a free diving class is, you know, the reason that we can get, you know, anyone to hold their breath for two to three minutes is I know how to reach into the body, press the button, turn the knobs, adjust the dials to your actual free diving physiology and make that dive reflex come out. Now, everyone has the dive reflex. But it's considered like a, it's, a, it's, it's graded, right? So my dive reflex is much stronger than yours because, you know, I dive all the time. Yet you compare me to a world record free diver, their dive reflex is going to be much stronger than mine. Now, the reflex itself is composed of several components, right? And so I'll kind of go through those. Um, one of them is bradycardia which is just a fancy name for rapid onset of the lowering of the heart rate. Mm -hmm. So you'll see the heart rate drop upwards of 50% as soon as the body has a contraction. So the contraction is happening. You're holding your breath uh, for a certain amount of time. Your body's going to say, hey, this is maybe, you know, maybe you should take a breath and it's going to trigger a contraction. So contractions feels like if you never had one, it's like a hiccup. If you hold your breath long enough, <laughs> you'll have one. And it's actually the body trying to draw that, uh, draw that, uh, make you take a breath. But we as free divers are going to say, no, not, not quite yet. Now, that contraction um, is, is going to be obviously trying to make you take a breath. So one of the things that the body does is now that it realizes that you're not going to breathe, it's going to say, hey, let's, let's consume, let's lower the demand of oxygen. So it actually drops that heart rate 
you know, up to 50 beats to try to be more uh, oxygen, conserve the oxygen, right? So that's a very helpful part of the diet reflex. Uh, there are several other components. Um, one of the things that happens is uh, the blood vessels and the fingers and the toes will constrict, right? And the idea is it's trying to push all the blood to our core where we need it, heart, lung, and brains. That's also why we get the P reflex, right? Free divers and scuba divers are probably familiar with the fact as soon as they get in the water, they feel like they have to pee. Now, it's even stronger. So that's what's going on. Yeah, I mean, it, like it, yeah. it happens even when you're just cold in general. So, so what's happening is your your peripheral organs or your peripheral extremities are constricting, and when that happens, it actually ca- does it cause like a vasodilation of of the the uh, the vessels leading into the areas responsible for urination, or how is ex- exactly is that working? Well, it's just it's pushing all of the it's all the all of a sudden all the fluid you know from the the blood vessels that are shrinking are, are coming into the core, and right and then at that point they're going hey there's too much fluid in here we got to get rid of that and that's going to trigger that that's going to trigger that urge to urge to pee okay. and it's definitely strong stronger with free divers than than scuba divers you still get it both ways but the breath holding uh, has access does it as well so for me you know if I do a a deep dive, like, you know, let's say I'm teaching a class and I'm doing, you know, hundred plus foot dives. Almost every time I come up, I'll have an urge to urge to go to the bathroom, right? Just, yeah. you know, just a tiny bit, but it's like almost every time, yeah. right? but that depth trigger exacerbates me, it even me more. too. Me too. Yeah. Now, now I've talked a lot on the show before about the vagus nerve and the importance of vagal nerve tone to have a healthy nervous system response, healthy feedback to the heart, healthy balance of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. A lot of people track heart rate variability, right? And a high heart rate variability is a good sign you're recovered, that your nervous system is ready to train or ready for stress. And in many people with poor vagal nerve function, one of the main reasons their HRV is low is because of that poor vagal nerve function. Now, from what I understand, when, when we activate that mammalian dive reflex, we somehow somehow trigger that vagus nerve to become more toned because that, that's what's producing that bradycardia, that lowering of the heart rate that you talked about. Uh, now, when it, when it comes to things like uh, heart rate variability or the, or the vagus nerve, have you looked into that or, or tracked that at all yourself? That's, that's really something that I don't, I mean, I, I know all this, what you're saying is true, but it's not something that I have a lot of area of expertise on. I mean, certainly, you know, free divers, we talk about that. I know those things happen when we're holding our breath, but it's yeah. not something I, I've done a lot of research. I'd into. be fascinating to see like kind of a study of free divers and heart rate variability. Cause I'd, I'd guess theirs is profoundly higher than, than their, than, than, you know, the general population. I mean, people who do well, like Wim Hof breathing, which I want to ask you about here in a bit and, and, yeah. you know, breath holding, get that. But I think once you add in that, that cold water exposure, getting the face under, which you don't get in like a, like a cryotherapy chamber, right? You got to get into the water. You see that improvement in vagal nerve tone that, that I think is, is very impressive. It would be interesting to see if I could get some of my competitive freediver friends, you know, during a competition where they're going to be going through this a lot. Um, you know, as more and more of them have the ability to track, you know, because it's, it's a lot easier to track that now than it used to be. That would yeah. be something interesting to reach out to those guys and see what, see what happens. So yeah. if I can do that, I will, uh, I will let you, uh, interpret the results. I'll be interested to see. Yeah, what you think. it would be very interesting. We, we just get them, get them, uh, an aura ring, which is the, the yep. ring that will, yep. well, you know what? The aura ring tracks it during sleep. It wouldn't track it during the actual dive. We could see what's happening during a night of sleep afterwards. Uh, the other way yep. to do it would be like, uh, uh, the whoop wristband would do it. That that's one that could track it in real time. So they could put on this wristband during their dives. And I, I'm pretty sure that's water resistant to, a hundred meters or so. So that's about as, as deep as most of the folks are going to, are going to be. Um, now what about the spleen? I, there was a research study. It, it, it's, it's a relatively new research study, but it looked at, at what happens when just dry land, not even in the water, you hold your breath. Uh, in, in this study, they did five maximal apneas, like five maximal breath holds with, with, uh, um, without being in the water. And what they noted in these folks was an improvement uh, in terms of red blood cell production and blood flow uh, in and out of the spleen. 
So what's the connection between the spleen and breath holding and the spleen and diving? Yeah, so that is another part of that mammalian dive reflex, right? So you got bradycardia, you've got the, the blood shunting, and then splenic contraction. So, uh, you know, I had first heard of that probably maybe 15 years ago. They had done some, uh, Kirk, the head of performance free diving, had done some studies uh, and kind of saw that. So the first thing they did was they put, they put Tanya Streeter in a hyperbaric chamber, which simulates going to death. And they measured, I believe it was a 20% uh, in, in decrease in volume of the spleen. And they also measured an increase in uh, the hermetic rate, right? So the spleen is a reservoir for red blood cells. It's like the hospital. So when that thing compresses, it's shooting more red blood cells in the system, increasing your oxygen carrying capacity. So then the researchers said, oh, well, it's not because of breath holding. It was just because of the pressure of being in the hyperbaric chamber that did it. So then later, they did an experiment with Mandy uh, Crookshank where she literally just laid down on the table and held her breath and just holding her breath on dry land compresses the spleen right so the idea is this is another reflex that's designed to increase our ability to hold our breath right because in essence this is legal blood doping is what it is right i mean so this is increasing that hermetic uh, uh, level so that now the body can be better uh, can transport and store more oxygen so one of the things i've always <laughs> I always laugh about is when I talk about this in the program, right? In the intermediate course, I get into the, you know, the, the splenic contractions and all this sort of stuff is I always envision one of these days you're going to turn on the Olympics and you're going to see this sprinter, right? And he's going to have a little immersion logo on his uniform and he's going to be doing his warm ups just like everyone else, except he's going to be holding his breath, right? Why? Because he's trying to trigger that splenic contraction, right? He's then going to win the gold medal. And then when they drug test him, they're going to be, oh, yeah, your hermetic level is way too high. And they're going to test all his blood and there's going to be nothing in it. And then they're going to be like, we don't know what happened, right? Because it's yeah. legal, it's legal, it's legal, it's legal blood doping. Yeah. Now, what we don't know, and I would be interested to find out, maybe listeners or you or whatever, is we know that in elite athletes, just the aspect of holding your breath is going in, gonna to induce a splenic contraction. I can guarantee you if one of your listeners holds your breath, their spleen isn't going to contract, right? Because the body is going to be going, what in the heck are you doing? You need to breathe. Whereas in an elite athlete, you know, they're doing this all the time. So one of the things that happen is, is the more that you free dive – your body starts to work for you. It starts to do all these things to help you do better. One of the reasons I can do what I do is because my dive reflex is strong. Whereas if I've got a brand new student, their body's going, why aren't you breathing anymore? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So it's, uh, and that's what I mean by it's a great response. The more that you do it, the stronger that dive reflex becomes and allows you to perform better as a free diver. Yeah, but before I bought that book by James Nestor called Deep that I was talking about earlier, what what had got me interested in the first place was I believe it was an article James wrote. It was like, you know, New York Times or Wall Street Journal or one one of these these uh accessible websites that you can you can uh read news articles on. He wrote about how Olympic athletes were actually getting into free diving as a way to enhance performance, particularly because of the red blood cell production or or the, you know, the quote, blood doping or the legal blood doping unquote that 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 you were just alluding to uh, and, and just so so you the listener understand what's going on here uh you know there there's a long time you know my background is in exercise physiology and physiologists long believed that the spleen was like this redundant organ that kind of shared the liver's function of destroying old red blood cells in the liver and uh, it actually has this secondary function because huge volumes of blood circulate through it. So it acts as like this reservoir of blood. And when you, when you compress it, you get this big release of red blood cells. I mean, there are other things that, that could do that. Like, like we know that getting into the sauna – after a after a workout when you're already hot that doesn't compress the spleen but it does increase your your red blood cell production and your erythropoietin production and you you could and I do this sometimes I'll do breath holds in the sauna to kind of double up on that effect and get my spleen to jump into the game too but it it still doesn't really really match what you get once you introduce the compression that occurs when you're actually, you know, in the water and, and diving to depth. So, um, would you say there are any other benefits besides the spleen, the mammalian dive reflex, the 
vagus nerve um, and just the freaking enjoyment that comes out of being in the water? I mean, it's, it's, it's just overall well-being. I mean, you talk to people that free dive and they, you know, they get all starry eyed and they're just like, oh, it's just amazing that you'd be down there. And it's just it's just completely it's it, it, when you're not a free diver, you're like you're like, how can being underwater and drowning and suffocating be relaxing? Well, when you do it right, you don't feel like you're drowning. You don't feel like you're, you're just, you know, you're completely relaxed. You're weightless. I mean, it is a, uh, it's, 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 it's an unused, it's, it's not like anything else I've certainly ever done. And, you know, you talk to people that do it and they'll, they all swear by it. Yeah. I guess the only other thing to consider here would be like for people who, who like to exercise to lose weight or to burn calories. I mean, when you combine the, the, the cold with the rigors of like diving down and coming back up and diving down and coming back up. And then if you're spearfishing, you combine that with the resistance training aspect of having to pull the big elastic band on that that roller, you know, basically what you're doing is exercise in a giant liquid cryotherapy chamber. And so you actually, I don't, uh, do, have you ever seen any studies or anything that looks in like how many calories you would burn per hour doing something like free diving? I heard or saw some study, but that was like seven, eight years ago. And it seemed very anecdotal, but it did. I think it was categorized in spearfishing, but it was in this report that I saw. It was one of the, the highest ones. But I will tell you, it is exhausting. I mean, like, you know, I of all the workouts that I do, when I teach a class, I come home and I'm exhausted, you know, oh, three yeah. hours, you know, diving up and down that line. Exactly. Cause you have the, not only of the, the, the work of doing all the dives, you've got the, your body's trying to generate your body heat and you know, keep that up. So it uh, is, uh, okay. it is, dude. It, it's a very challenging dude. I just found the study. It is 11, I'm sorry, 1,120 calories per hour that you burn free diving. I mean, to put that into context, playing basketball is 400 calories an hour. Uh, Dancing is 200 calories an hour. The steeplechase is 700 calories. Hunting, (laughs) hunting, which I love to do, like bow hunting, that's 175 calories per hour. Even boxing in the ring during a boxing match is 840 calories per hour. So free diving is like basically, uh, I'm, I'm looking at this list. There's the only thing close to it is uh people who are racing like running races and are doing their 5k's in somewhere in the range of 14 to 16 minutes like that matches yes. free di- that's nuts yeah free diving that's crazy yeah. so so i'm actually i wonder if you know so i understand that one you know the being in the water you, your body generates a lot of energy to try to keep that you know to keep the temperature uh normal that that does a lot of work but what i guess i don't understand if you have any insight on is the is how does the breath breath holding part of it i mean i it certainly seems reasonable that it makes it more difficult but i'm not sure how that translates into a calorie burn i don't think the breath hold would translate into a calorie burn aside from a shift in metabolic efficiency like like when when oxygen is not present and this is actually in in relation to the to the ketogenic diet component of this which is very interesting when oxygen is not present you you can tend to kind of shift towards like a a little bit more uh, glycolysis while you're in the water. And when you do that, you can increase what's called the glycogen sparing effect, meaning that once you're done with the dive, your body actually becomes very efficient at sparing carbohydrates, particularly via what's called beta oxidation or burning of fats and also the production of ketones to allow you, you know, ketones are the primary source of fuel for the diaphragm, for the liver, for the heart, and for the brain. And one could argue that those are used just as much as the muscles during free diving. And so not only would you increase your, your fat burning capacity once you're done with the diving, but also this, this would, this would go to say, and there's anecdotal evidence from guys like Dominique Diagostino, who was able to double his breath hold time from, he did it from two to four minutes. He didn't do any training. All he did was shift himself into ketosis. I don't know if you remember, but when I went down to, to immersion free diving and took your course, I took, uh, I took those ketone supplements. Like I, like I, I experimented with my breath hold with and without ketone supplements. And I had like a 40 to 50 second increase in breath hold time not even like shifting to a high fat diet or, or like changing my diet dramatically, but just 
by using ketones. And so, you know, not only are you enhancing your body's own ability to use ketones, but one could argue, and again, I haven't seen any long-term studies on this, that if you were to supplement with ketones or be on a ketogenic diet, you could actually increase your breath hold via that method as well. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I'm curious if any other uh, kind of elite divers are playing oh, around with that. I'm sure we'll get some divers listening in. So, so if, if, if you do dive and you listen in and you've experimented with ketosis, leave a comment over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash free diving podcast. Uh, in the absence of, of like ketones though, what are some other ways that we can take bigger breaths or hold our breaths for a longer period of time? Like what are, what are your ninja secrets for getting a longer breath hold time? So it's, it's a couple of things. So first off, the, the, um, the, the one way is just take down, if you want to increase your breath hold, whether you're a free diver, spear fisherman, underwater basket weaver, whatever it is you do under, underwater, you, you take down more fuel. Right. So simply taking a bigger breath. Now, the average person, if they take a breath, they, it's all from the chest. Right. So you probably remember from the class me doing this thing where you do diaphragm, then chest, then shoulders, then neck. Right. So our rib cage. Right. Is your, your lungs are basically trapped inside of the cage, the, the, the rib cage. And everyone says, oh, my lungs aren't that big. Well, it's not really your lungs that determine how big a breath you take. It's the flexibility of that rib cage, right? So when I teach my students to take a breath, I teach it in a very specific manner and it's designed to increase the size of that cage, right? So if I could somehow mechanically grab your rib cage and pull it apart so it was double in size, your lungs could fill that up. It's not the lungs that's limiting you, it's, it's the cage, right? So one, learning to take a bigger breath just by using the diaphragm, chest, shoulders, and, uh, will make a huge difference, right? Typically about 20 to 30% is what my students will, will do. Um, it's hard to demonstrate that over the podcast, but I do have a, a free course specifically on how to take a 20, 30% bigger breath, right? So absolutely on that. So one thing is you want to hold your breath longer, take a bigger breath. And by the way, for taking a bigger breath, is that that strategy that you talk about where, and I know you have a whole course on this that I'll link to on, on the podcast show notes. But in, in a nutshell, the, the, the quick 20 second overview, you're basically starting by breathing in uh, from like your diaphragm, and then you continue that breath going up to your chest, and then you continue that breath up into the shoulders, and then you kind of breathe, and then you kind of look up towards the sky and just like <laughs> you're sipping through a straw to like suck the rest of the breath in. Is that the technique you're referring to? Yeah, yeah, diaphragm, chest, shoulders, right? Didn't that just big, big, big breath? Um, and so that definitely makes a huge difference. I and mean, I have students that have been free diving for, you know, spear vision for 20, 30 years, and they always look at me bug eyed afterwards. Oh, that's the biggest breath I've ever taken. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, and, and you <laughs> right? can do it. You can do it while you're, I mean, you taught me how to do this while you're you're essentially, you know, prone in the water, looking down, floating in your wetsuit. All you do is you – and you have a snorkel in. By the way, for those of you who don't know, you do wear a snorkel when you free dive so, you, so you're able to, to, to breathe as you're looking down into the water at, at, the, at the fish or, or at you know the line you're going to travel down if you're free diving. And you can actually do that whole scenario if you think about it while you're prone in the water and then at the very end of the breath, you know, you're, you're on your stomach, but you just kind of shove your head forward and, and suck, suck, suck some more, right? Yeah. And so I mean, that, that's how it works. So you know, I always tell people it's – you know. Competitive freediving is, you know, spearfishing, recreational freediving is not the same as competitive freediving. So people tend to want to blow off competitive freedivers as this weird little subset. And my point is like, look, competitive freedivers, we know how to dive really deep. We know how to stay down a really long time. You should be very interested in how we do that. And competitive freedivers, you know, they have very specific training methodologies they go through that allow them to do that. So it definitely makes sense. It doesn't mean you want to be a competitive freediver, but if you want to improve your performance as a freediver, you should do all the things competitive freedivers do because it works. Hey, I want to interrupt today's show to make you salivate. There is this company that has some of the best nut butters on the face of the planet. They've got Barney's powdered almond butter. They've got Nuts Go Organic Power Fuel, which is seven different nuts and seed butters. They have the Yum Butter Superfood Cashew Butter Pouches for on the go. Not only do they have butters, but they have vitamin supplements, bath and body products, beauty products, and it's all extremely, extremely 
high standard stuff. They only select non-GMO, eco-friendly, organic, basically everything, like 80% of this stuff you can't even find on Amazon, but then they knock the prices to 25 to 50% below traditional retail prices. And you can shop for fair trade certified, BPA free, sustainably farmed, you name it. And you don't have to worry about reading the labels because they have already done all the homework for you. Plus when they package this food and ship it off to your house, over 98% of their packaging is post consumer recycled and filled with recycled paper denim or newspaper wraps instead of plastic bubbles so there's a hundred percent zero waste it is called drum roll please thrive market thrive market and you get 25 percent off your first order and a free 30-day trial when you go to thrivemarket.com slash ben that's thrivemarket.com forward slash Ben. Pick up some of that nut butter too while you're at it. Their their nut butter section is just like mind-blowing, mind-blowingly delicious, that is. This podcast is also brought to you by Harry's, Harry's Shave Club. Here is what's going on with Harry's. When you go to harrys.com slash greenfield, that's H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com slash greenfield, they will give you a $13 value trial set that comes with everything you need for the most amazing shave imaginable. Very close, comfortable shave. They have a weighted ergonomic handle. They've got a five-blade razor with a lubricating strip and a trimmer blade. They've got rich lathering shave gel. They've got a travel blade cover. I didn't even know you could get all this stuff with a razor, but they've got all of that, and you get that trial set. When you go to harrys.com slash Greenfield, they've got over 20,000 five-star reviews on Trustpilot, on Google. They bought a world-class blade factory in Germany. It's been making quality blades for over 95 years, and they ship them straight to you. No gimmicks, no vibrating heads or flex balls or handles that look like spaceships, uh, tactics that a lot of brands have been using to raise prices for years. These are just wonderfully designed Very affordable razors with a 100% quality guarantee. So you can check them out at harrys.com, H-A-R-R-Y-S.com forward slash Greenfield. What about the use of uh, apnea, like static apnea tables? I'm going to link to some, some CO2 and O2 apnea tables in the show notes, but a lot of people don't know what those are. Can you explain what an apnea table is and what the difference would be between CO2 and O2 apnea. Yeah. So I'll explain what a table, the tables are, and I'm going to explain what, in my opinion, is the most time effective and efficient way to do this. Now, so a table is, if you hang out with free divers, they talk about doing tables. Tables simply means it's, you're doing a series of breath holds. Oftentimes it's eight breath holds in a row. And a table basically has two variables. It tells you how long you get to breathe up for, and then it tells you how long you breathe for, right? So let's look at a CO2 table. Well, the reason we do tables is free diving, we have to basically deal with two issues. We have to learn to tolerate low levels of oxygen because as we hold our breath, our oxygen level drops. When we consume that oxygen, CO2 is one of the waste products that's created. When we exhale, we're exhaling out that carbon dioxide. So as our oxygen level drops, CO2 level is rising. We have to tolerate high levels of CO2 and low levels of oxygen. So um, a carbon dioxide table might say something like this. You breathe up for two minutes, and then you hold your breath for two minutes. And then the next one, you breathe up for a minute 45, and you hold your breath for two minutes. And you breathe up for a minute 30, hold for two. Minute 15, hold for two. Minute, hold for two. You're getting less and less time. And at the end, it might actually be you could only breathe up for 15 seconds, hold your breath for two minutes, repeat it again, 15 second, breathe up, hold for two. So what's happening is you're only holding your breath for two minutes every time. But because you're getting less and less time to breathe up, your carbon dioxide level is getting is your breath hold starts with more CO2. So therefore, at the end of the breath hold, you're going to have even more CO2. All right. So that is your typical CO2 table. That was the way I was taught to do it. That's the way I did it. But I have definitely found, uh, I think, a much better way. Uh, I certainly didn't create this. I first heard about it called a Wonka table. Um, and I believe it was from Free Dive Paradise, but that might not be exactly correct. But what did you but, call it? Um, Wonka table? Well, that was the guy, Richard Wonka is the guy that invented it. Not Willie. C- correct. Okay. And, uh, and it's, it's what I do and it's what I teach all my students to do. So 
so here's there's an inherent problem with the traditional CO2 table, and it's as follows. If you remember, I said the very last two, I said you breathe up for 15 seconds, and then you hold your breath for two minutes, and then you breathe up for 15 seconds again, and you hold your breath for two minutes. Now, if you have 15 seconds to breathe between two two-minute breath holds, there is only one possible way you can do that, and you're going to be breathing like this. <laughs> Yeah, you know, as fast as you can, you are going to be hyperventilating your head off. The table is designed so there's no other way for you to pass it than to hyperventilate. Now, hyperventilation dumps your CO2, drops your CO2 level more than any possible way of breathing out there. And let's think back. What is the point of a CO2 table? It is supposed to teach you to tolerate high levels of CO2. Well, if that's what it's trying to do, why would it force you to breathe in such a way that dumps as much CO2 as humanly possible in that amount of time? In my opinion, those two things are counterintuitive, right? They don't go together, right? Right, Because you're lowering your CO2 as much as possible right before you hold your breath and you're trying to get high CO2. So here's the, here's the better way. Let's, let's walk through this. Imagine I was going to do two breaths. Let's say, let's call it two minutes. This is what we're doing, two minute breath hold. And beforehand, I'm going to take five breaths, one, two, three, four, five, and then I'm going to hold my breath for two minutes. But you know what? I'd like a little bit more CO2. I want to start with more CO2. So instead of five breaths, do you understand if I took four breaths instead of five, I would start with a little bit more carbon dioxide because I had less time to get rid of it. Right. Well, if I wanted more than four, I could do three, and I want more than that, I could do two. There, you want to get the most amount of CO2 possible? You're only allowed one breath between the two breath holds. There's no way possible that you're going to have more CO2 stored in your system than if you only take one breath in between the breaths. Okay, so here's how this works. Now, this sounds crazy, but I can even my entry level students can, can do this because here's all I'm asking. And this is the this is the way that I teach them to do it. All you need is a stopwatch. You don't need an app. You don't need to log on anywhere, right? It's very simple. Okay. You're going to sit, you're going to sit on the couch. And, and what, and what you're, you're, what you're about to teach us is basically this, this Wonka table. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One, one blood CO2 table, Wonka table. Um, you're going to sit on the couch, right? Do this on dry land, not in the water, right? There's no risk of, you know, so you're going to do this on dry land. You're going to hold your breath. And at some point it's going to be uncomfortable. And you're going to feel a contraction. I don't care if that takes you 20 seconds. I don't care if you're maybe you already some free diving experience. That might go for two minutes. doesn't matter when it is. I don't care. But as soon as you feel that contraction, that first hiccup, that first contraction, it's now becoming difficult. And so you're going to start your stopwatch. And you're going to only deal with that uncomfortableness for 15 seconds. 15 seconds. Any anyone can do that yeah at the end of the 15 seconds you're going to take one breath and you're going to do it very specifically like this you're going to do a slow inhale using your teeth and tongue to make that sound as you exhale so you're going to go that's the exhale and then big breath and hold again at some point, I don't care if it's 15 seconds or two minutes, it's going to become difficult. What are you going to feel? Contraction. You feel that contraction, start your stopwatch, and you do 15 seconds, right? So the goal is, and by the way, this is going to trigger, when you do that exhalation, you are going to get a massive urge to go to the bathroom. So if you have not gone to the bathroom before you start this, you will not be able to finish this. So do yourself hmm. a favor, go to the bathroom before you start, then you'll be really good to go, otherwise you're going to quit. Now, the goal is, when I do these, let's say I do six, and if I'm feeling saucy, feeling good, maybe I'll do eight. But if I can do six, I'll still pat myself on the shoulder and say, that was a good job. Now, what's great about this is it's only 15 seconds. When you did took your class with me, I assure you, when you were doing statics in the pool, you went through way more than 15 seconds of uncomfortableness, right? I mean, there right. were probably minutes, minutes with an S on it of when you're like, good Lord, I want to breathe. So anyone can accomplish what I just laid out. And the idea is, if it's super easy for you, awesome. Do 20 seconds, do 30, you know, you're just moving that number, 
right? And just making it bigger based on your your ability level. Now, the other thing I like about the CO2 uh, table is, you know, when I used to do your traditional, you know, training, some of those tables would take me an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. You know, this, you, you can do this in like 10 minutes because basically you're just you, – you're skipping all the point where it's easy and you're just getting right to the point yeah, where it no, sucks. Now, the last time I talked to you, you said that you were doing some of this stuff while you were exercising, like walking or light jogging. Is this something that you can do, say, if you're out on a walk or is, it, is there too much risk of hypoxia and passing out? This – no, you want to – this is – you're doing this laying on the couch. Okay. You know? Yeah, not doing anything else. Now, you can incorporate uh, a breath holding into, in essence, any exercise. So, for instance, when I was, um, you know, really into competitive freediving and, and trying to train, one of the things that I noticed is I was stuck at about 200 feet for maybe a year and a half because I couldn't equalize any deeper because that kind of depth equalizing is very complicated. And eventually I worked through that. And then I started, you know, doing 65, 70 meters. And then my limit became my legs, right? The lactic acid, because you know, I'm doing dives for, let's say they last two, and that's two and a half minutes that I have no access to, you know, no other oxygen than what I took down. And then you're generating a lot of lactic acid. So one of the things that was my weakness was my legs would just couldn't do it anymore. They, they're just, they were done. So I would do uh, lactic uh, tolerance training where I'm doing, you know, almost any typical breath exercise you would do at the gym except I do super lightweight and I hold my breath for 30 seconds and it's as many as I can, as fast as I can for 30 seconds, right? You know, trying to get that, you know, extreme lactic buildup. So I would do a lot of stuff, you know, with my quads um, and, you know, it's brutal because you're, <laughs> you're not breathing. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of funny looks at the gym. I would definitely, you know, anytime you're doing breath only stuff, there is a risk of, uh, of blacking out. Um, so I would, Always try to do these on seated equipment, right? Okay. You know, so I'm yeah. sitting sitting down in some way, right? Because right. most of the gyms, they're going to have places where you can do that, right? Right. Um, you know, I've I've heard some some not nice stories from people on treadmills doing this. Uh, you can imagine that could go really bad. Um, so, like, you know, if you want to do cardio yeah. and do it, you know, recum- recumbent bike is a better option. Yeah, um, exactly. I, I would I would do things at the. Uh, um, uh, you know, I do apnea walks and, and jog, you know, I incorporate, you know, a, a lot of that stuff. But I mean, basically my world is I don't have access to oxygen. So if I want to train, you know, why am I breathing while I'm training? <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm trying to trying to get it as close to the, the world I operate in as possible. Yeah. I'm a big fan of books like Patrick McCown's Oxygen Advantage, or there's another one by uh, Anders Olson. Uh, I forget the the name of his book. It's um, the the power of your breath. I think is the name of it. And these guys go into the value of training yourself how to engage primarily in nasal breathing, even up to relatively intense periods of exercise, because that enhances oxygenation, uh, humidifies the air, warms the air that you're breathing in, mm-hmm. and kind of keeps you from activating those sh- those barrel receptors in your chest that can tend to cause like a sympathetic nervous system cortisol response. And so, a lot of times, what I'll do is I'll I'll go on a walk. And I'll have certain periods where I hold my breath for as long as possible, but the entire walk is breathing through my nose. And even the recoveries after my breath hold are through my nose. And I find that that alone, you know, just going on those long walks seems to do a really good job with my breath hold time, you know, even in the absence of a regular apnea breath hold practice. But I need to try yeah. these these Wonka tables that you're talking about now. You know, maybe, maybe I'll make that part of a sauna session or something like that. But that's very interesting. I hadn't heard of these tables before. Yeah, it's uh, and I just, you know, it's it's effective. It's it's ti- it's time efficient. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I always I always tell people in the class is whenever you see me like clap my hands and get really excited about something, and say, oh, this is going to be awesome. Eventually you learn that when I do that, I'm about to do something. You're about to do something awful. These wonky tables, they're awesome. They are yeah. awesome. 
Now, what about when you're actually in the water? So let's say somebody is, is out there in the water. They either want to dive deep uh, or they're spearfishing and they want to go down after a fish. Maybe it's, you know, let, let's say someone's used to being able to go 12 to 15 feet deep and they want to now go like, you know, let, let's just say 15 to 30 feet deep. Now, when they're there on the on the surface of the water, looking down on their stomach, in addition to that that breath that we were talking about where you start from your diaphragm and kind of move your way up all the way up to your shoulders and suck in every last bit of oxygen. Is there any type of breath work that you can do in between dives or in between going down to fish that allows you to kind of prepare for that dive in a manner that would allow you to hold your breath for a longer period of time? Like, is there a a frequency, like how many seconds in, how many seconds out or anything like that? Yeah, so I would say the most important thing is, right, when you, you know, every free diving instructor is going to teach you a different way, right? Like, you know, some instructors, they'll, they'll teach you and argue that, oh, it should be this way and this way is better than that way. And, and I'll be honest, I don't think it really any way is that much different than any other way as long as you're doing one thing. Any free diving instructor is going to teach you diaphragmatic breathing. Right. So that's absolutely what we want to be doing. The other way to put it is you want to be conscious on how you breathe. The average person hasn't taken any training, free divers, spear fishermen. They're just breathing however they think they need to breathe. Right. And I'm going to tell you that, you know, diaphragmatic breathing is going to be a huge improvement over that. So the idea is when I say diaphragmatic breathing, you want to when you're breathing in and out, if you were to put your hand on your chest and your hand on your stomach, The only thing you should feel moving is your stomach goes out and your stomach goes in. Your chest should be absolutely motionless. When I have students try this in class, no one can do this at first because we all are chest breathers, right? We we start as, uh, I mean, every infant, right, is that you look at an infant on their back and watch how they breathe. Their belly goes up and down, right? They didn't have to take a yoga class or a free diving class to learn diaphragmatic breathing. That's just the way we are. Right. As we get older for societal, get older for societal pressures, we you're taught to never stick your stomach out. In fact, you're supposed to walk around your stomach sucked in all the time. So we kind of lose that natural ability of diaphragmatic breathing. But if you can teach yourself to to do diaphragmatic breathing, the way you test is hand on your chest, hand on your stomach. You want to do a slow inhalation, a couple seconds, take a good breath and then just exhale. I like teeth and tongue to make this sound. So that I'm regulating how much air comes out. And you can still do that with a with a snorkel in your mouth? Snorkel. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Snorkels in the mouth, teeth and tongue. I make that exact same sound. And you just exhale to what's comfortable. But, you know, if it's five seconds, ten seconds, whatever. Main thing is do what's comfortable. But what we're doing is we are on purpose slowing our breathing down. That's going to slow our heart rate down, right? And so I can, when I'm out free diving, whatever I'm doing – I can 99% of the time breathe like that. Now, can I sprint around like that? No, but but if you're doing things right, you shouldn't be doing that because the more you raise your heart rate, the more you lower your your, your bottom time, right? So I can I'm breathing like that the entire time I'm out there on the surface the whole time, slow, relaxed diaphragmatic breathing just like what you would do at a yoga class you walk out of a yoga class and you're like oh my god i feel so relaxed why because you did diaphragmatic breathing for 50 minutes Hmm. that's why you feel good do you have a certain period of time where you're doing the inhale and the exhale like is it is it five seconds in 10 seconds out or any type of rules like that it 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 doesn't matter i mean i typically do two and two second in 10 second out but two two in 10 out yeah but what's more important then the numbers is that it's whatever's comfortable for you and that you're, you are controlling your breathing instead of not thinking about it. Cause if you're not thinking about it, you're going to be have a tendency to breathe more like that, which is going to, you know, increase the heart rate and just not be relaxing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now what about when it comes to, uh, the, the idea of getting down to that depth that you want to get to, a lot of people will do, and this is what uh, many of us are taught when we're in the pool, when we're kids or whatever, or we figure this out on our own, this whole Valsalva maneuver where you just kind of plug your nose and go, 
try and equalize that way. Why doesn't that work when you get, I mean, for me, once I get to about 15 feet or so, that doesn't work. So why doesn't that work and, and what should we be doing instead? Yeah. So Valsalva is the, you know, it's the way most people are taught to equalize. I mean, I, as a scuba instructor, that's the way I teach, you know, I teach people to equalize and uh, it, it's, it's very simple. The reason scuba instructors do it is one, they don't really understand the difference between Valsalva and Frenzel. And it's very simple to teach. If I've got a 12 year old kid in a scuba class and I'm like, Hey, little Johnny, can you, can you equalize your ears? Uh, uh-uh. okay, can you pinch your nose, Johnny? Uh, huh. Now blow your nose real hard. And he's like, Oh, my ears. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Right. It's yeah. called the pinch and blow method, right? You pinch your nose and you blow your nose and it equalizes your ears. Now here's where things get confusing, especially because we get a lot of scuba divers take the class, right? If you use Valsalva as a scuba diver, you can scuba dive to 200 feet using that. It, it'll work fine. So we run into issues. I've had scuba instructors take my class and get stuck at 15 feet. I'm trying to explain to them, look, man, you need to be doing, you know, frenzel. And they're like, yeah, Ted, I, you know, I'm, I'm a scuba instructor. I can eat my ears just fine. And then they get stuck at 15 feet. And they're like, all right, well, what's this whole frenzel thing? All right. So there's another method of equalization called frenzel that is free divers we have to be doing Valsalva will typically stop working for a free diver around 50 or 30 feet, I mean 15 to 30 feet. Okay. Now you'll see, you'll see people go, I can Valsalva down to 50 feet. Yeah. But they dive, they don't dive down straight like a laser. They dive at a 45 degree angle. And then every time they equalize, they have to turn their head up until their heads at the surface. Then they can equalize and then they turn back down. What a terribly inefficient way to get down to depth. If you want to go down straight like a laser, just boom, 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 pinch your nose and equalize every time, you got to be doing frenzel. Now, I'll answer your question. Why doesn't Valsalva work? And here's why. Um, When you're doing Valsalva, like imagine a scuba diver, right? So a scuba diver, when they go down to depth, typically they're head up, feet down, right? That's the way that they go down, right? So their head's facing the surface. So every time you take a breath off your regulator as a scuba diver, your lungs are fully inflated. When your head is facing the surface, the air naturally wants to go to your ears because air rises, right? So when you're scuba diving, you're in this position where your head up, the air naturally wants to go that way. And so it's very simple to equalize your ears. Now, as a free diver, we turn around. Now our feet are facing the surface and our head is towards the bottom. So when we start diving down, the air wants to go to our fins, but we want it down here by our head. And what's happening to the supply of air as we go down? It's shrinking, 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 right? So that's why Valsalva doesn't work, right? It, it's, it's squeezing the air. It's squeezing an ever and ever shrinking supply of air and trying to push it the, wall, the way it doesn't want to go. And that's why it typically doesn't work till around 15, 30 feet, right? If I remember in your class, you were, you know, in the beginning, you were doing Valsalva and you were stuck right at that, that depth. Didn't matter how hard you pushed, didn't matter what you did, you just stuck, right? So right. F- free divers need to be doing what's called the Frenzel method of equalization. Valsalva takes the air that's in your lungs, your throat is open, you're compressing your chest and lung and stomach, and you're pushing that air into your ears, right? You can tell if you're doing Valsalva very simply. Put your hand on your stomach, pinch your nose, equalize five times in a row. Boom, 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 boom. If you feel your chest compressing every time you're doing that, you're doing Valsalva. Mm -hmm. Frenzel, completely different animal. Frenzel takes the air that's in your mouth and shoves it directly into your ears and your throat is shut. So your lungs are not involved whatsoever. And you're doing this whole thing. They always say, use your tongue as a piston and push the air into the eustachian tubes, right? And so Frenzel, you know, doesn't have that depth limitation. And by the way, that that's, that's F-R-E-N-Z-E-L, right? Correct. Yep. Yeah. And so that's the, the, uh, the method that free divers have to do. And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's tricky to teach. When I when I interrupted you, you were beginning to to say how Frenzel would differ from Valsalva. Well, uh, yeah. So I mean, Frenzel, it's just it's just it takes the air that's in your mouth as opposed to the air that's in your lungs, and you're using your tongue to push that air into the eustachian tube instead of compressing your chest and stomach and shoving that air uh, into the ears. 
Okay. All right. So, so the way that you would actually learn the Frenzel technique, and I know that you, you have courses on this online, you, you've got, you do one-on-one Skype sessions with people like you, you did it with me leading up to that free diving course that I did with you. But what's, what's kind of the basic overview of, of what the Frenzel would sound like or look like or be accomplished? It's very, very, very tricky to teach. I mean, I guess, I mean, you know, that, you know, that's why you should spend an hour with every student, you know, on Skypes. And, you know, now, as you know, I don't do that anymore. I just, they get the online program and I love it. They just walk in the door and they can do friends. It makes my life so much easier. I don't have to do another 500 hours of Skype sessions, but the, the simple explanation, and sometimes, sometimes it works. Sometimes literally I just, they pick it up instantaneously, right? So if you want to try that, um, uh, make the, uh, put your tongue, in the position like you would make the T sound. If you think about that, mm-hmm. the, the tip of your tongue is on the back of your teeth. The sides of your tongue are on the, on the molars, right? So, so Frenzel, is you put your tongue in that position, and if you can imagine what that does is that creates like a, it, it creates like a sandwich. The tongue is the bottom part of the sandwich, the bottom loaf of bread, and the middle is the air that's trapped in between your tongue and then the top slice of bread is the roof of your mouth, right? So what you're trying to do is you put your tongue in that position, you shut your throat, you pinch your nose, and you try to push your tongue up to the roof of the mouth. And so what that's going to do, it's just going to compress that air that's stuck in there and it's going to try to make it come out your nose, but your nose is pinched. So it can't go out that way. That's why you will see the nostrils flare and then it will go into the ears, right? So you can try it with what I call the T block doing it like that. Another way you can do it is what's called the K block. When you make the K sound, Mm -hmm. the middle of your tongue is on the roof of the mouth. So again, the same kind of thing. You can start to make the K sound where the middle of your tongue is on the roof of your mouth. But instead of making the K sound, you don't, you don't let that air go forward. Right when the middle of your tongue hits the top of the roof of your mouth, the back of your tongue pushes up while you pinch the nose. And you can do it that way. So those are kind of two uh, ways that people do that is the, the, the T block or the K block. And some people – you know, some people can just, you know, I, I tell them that and they're like, what's the big fuss? So, you know, some people pick it up quite easily. But what's difficult is if you're a if you're a lifelong Valsalva, then that explanation probably isn't going to cut it. <laughs> right. It's the it's the people that have been doing it one way for a long time. Yeah. It's difficult to transition them over. Yeah. Especially when you're stressed out and maybe you have a spear gun in your hand, you're going after a fish. Yeah, you have to make it almost like second nature. That's what I'd found. Like I thought I had it nailed when I did dry land training, and then once I got in the water and had all these other things going through my head, I just lost it. Right. So, so it takes a, a lot of practice to learn. But man, now that I know Frenzel, like it's it's it, it's easy. Like you just you yeah. go down and you just you just do it. it. You'll never think about it. You never once it, once the light bulb goes off. Like beforehand, it seems like. Good Lord, there's like 13 steps I have to do with my tongue. How am I going to ever free dive? I can't even do it sitting on the couch. But then once the light yeah. bulb goes off, you never have to think about it again. Yeah, the best tip I can give to people is go do it in a pool first. Like, learn, even if it's just, you know, like your local YMCA pool or whatever, which might go down to 15 feet, you can at least play around with it without having to worry about the ocean and you know, distractions and the cold, you just go down and practice it in the pool. And especially for people who might be at the gym anyways, you know, doing a lap swim session or lifting weights or whatever, that's simple enough to just hop in the pool and, and do it. I find that that works far better than like practicing it on dry land because once you're in the water, it's, it's a little bit different. It, it feels different yeah. and it, it works differently. Uh, now I also want to ask you, because this is obviously extremely popular, this whole idea of, Wim Hof and Wim Hof breath work where you do like a whole bunch of power breaths. Then you, then you, after you've done like 30 power breaths, uh, you, you breathe off as much oxygen as possible and you just hold your breath for as long as you can. I mean, it's it's essentially almost like hyperventilating followed by a, a breath hold. What is your take on that for increasing breath hold time or, or doing like Wim Hof does, which is where you'll do that and then you'll get in cold water and sometimes go underwater in cold water? 
Okay. So um, I've heard about Wim Hof breathing. Uh, I've had other freediving instructors talk to me about it. And in essence, what I what I what it seemed like to me was that you just hyperventilate your head off. And I did some Google and I saw him, you know, teaching people to do it. And in essence, it's just it's, it's a lot of hyperventilation before a breath hold. Um, so I don't know anything about cold. Uh, I'm assuming it's really good for that. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the the cold component, I think, is just that you're you're inducing vasodilation through that that power breathing. So, so essentially, you're you're actually shoving blood to your extremities that that could that could allow you to withstand the stressors of cold a little bit more. Uh, but yeah. but I'm I'm interested in in comparing and contrasting that breath hold technique to your breath hold technique. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what I was getting at is, it's is a cold person. Maybe that's great for cold as a breath holding tool. There's any freediving instructor from any agency on any continent would tell you you don't want to do that because hyperventilating before a breath hold increases the risk for blackout. And this is now most of his stuff he's doing dry land, as I understand it. But this is extremely dangerous. Well, I think Wim himself, and, and he's been a podcast guest a couple times. I think he's almost passed out, like underwater, like under the ice, doing this. Oh. Yeah. So, I mean, as a freediving instructor, and this is not me, you ask any freediving instructor, they will tell you absolutely under no circumstances. I mean, even freediving instructors that hate each other will say, don't hyperventilate before breath hold because it absolutely increases the risk of blackout. That's why every freediving agency teaches that. So let me explain why that's happening. Now, hyperventilation, as I mentioned earlier, when I talk about those CO2 tables, it lowers it, well, it drastically lowers your CO2. So it makes it so that when you start that breath hold, your CO2 is as low as possible. One of the biggest triggers for your urge to breathe is your carbon dioxide levels, right? Your physiologist will say 80% of your urge to breathe comes from rising carbon dioxide and 20% of it comes from low oxygen. So hyperventilation has a pretty obvious advantage. It's going to, since, you're, since you start with lower carbon dioxide, it's going to take longer for that CO2 level to get to where you have an urge to breathe or a contraction, right? So if you have a breath, a breath hold where you just hold your breath normally and you wait till you have a contraction, let's call it two minutes, and then you go backwards in time and you hyperventilate a bunch and you hold your breath again, now you might not get that contraction until 2.30 because you started with less carbon dioxide, all right? So hyperventilating absolutely delays your urge to breathe. I will not deny that it does that because it certainly does. So this is, this is why so many beginners like me, when I started, I would, you know, I could only, you know, I would, I remember free diving down to, you know, 20 foot of water and I'd stay there for like 20, 25 seconds. And I felt like I was going to die. And then when my captain told me to hyperventilate, and then I went to that same spot, I could stay down there for like 45, 50 seconds, right? Because it's delaying the onset of the urge to breathe. Now, here's the other thing that it does that people don't understand, and this is why every freediving instructor says don't hyperventilate. Not only does it delay the urge to breathe, it also physically reduces the amount of oxygen available to your body. This is a bad combination. The bore, can you get into the bore effect? So when we hold our breath, our blood is becoming more acidic, right? So... As our blood is becoming more acidic, you know, that's changing the pH levels of our blood. So when we hyperventilate, what that does is it's increasing the strength of the bond between hemoglobin and oxygen. So if I'm holding my breath and I've got, you know, all these hemoglobin molecules running around through my bloodstream, the hemoglobin molecule has little oxygen molecules attached to it. That's how it transports the oxygen. And then it pops off the oxygen and gives it to the muscle tissue so it can use it. If the strength of the bond between hemoglobin and oxygen is too high, that oxygen molecule can't pop off and be used as, as fuel. So it's stuck to the hemoglobin. So when we hyperventilate, right, it's altering the pH levels of our blood and it doesn't allow that oxygen to be used, right, because it's dropping the pH level uh, before the breath hold. We want, as the blood becomes more acidic, it, the, the, the strength between the hemoglobin and oxygen gets less, and then we can actually use that oxygen. But because it's shifting it so much the wrong way in the beginning, now at the end of the breath hold, there's still oxygen stuck on the hemoglobin that we can't access. So, so that's why it 
it's limiting the amount of oxygen available to your body. But it's confusing, especially for beginners, because they hyperventilate and they can instantly hold their breath longer. And then you get people saying, oh, yeah, well, you know, you just got to hyperventilate and it lets you access all the oxygen. They say that because they're holding their breath longer. So it seems logical. But the fact the facts are it's yeah, not. So, so I, essentially you have less oxygen available to the tissue, but also a lowered urge to breathe. And that's why when you're doing the Wim Hof breathing, you can hold your breath for a longer period of time. But, you know, it's also why you get the lightheadedness and the tingling and the potential for passing on. And I personally have found that when I jump into a cold pool or I, I have like cold bath protocols I do and I have some of my clients do this, like one of our workouts we do is you get three minutes into ice or a very cold bath, but you precede that with Wim Hof breathing. You slip into that bath while you're on your breath hold. You're not in deep water. You're you're in a you're in a tub. You're typically with someone, yep. and you're you're in that tub for a while. Then you get out and you do another round of breathing to kind of warm yourself back up. And sometimes all people hit the bike for a few minutes, then get back in the water. But but I'll never combine that with actually going underwater or deep water. And I'm pretty remiss to even do the Wim Hof breathing with the breath holds and be near water unless somebody else is there, even if it's shallow yeah. water. Yeah. I mean, it, it is, it absolutely increases the risk for blackout, right? You know, take a look at competitive free divers. They do the exact opposite, right? So basically if you understand what I was getting at is the more acidic your blood gets, the lower the, the strength of bond between hemoglobin and oxygen, meaning oxygen is more accessible. Well, this seems like a good thing, right? So if you look at like a competitive free diver, a world record holder, they're saying, Carbon dioxide is my friend. I want as much carbon dioxide in my blood as possible so that I can more quickly make that shift to where the oxygen becomes more readily accessible. So if you watch a competitive freediver breathing up, they might be doing what I would call minimal breathing where they're, they're breathing out. Mm -hmm. It's like they're sitting on the couch doing nothing. Right. right? That's the way they're breathing because they're, they want to keep every amount of carbon dioxide in their blood as possible so that they can shift that way. Now, Thanks to the wonderful world of the internet, you know, people will be like, oh, Ted, well, why don't you, you know, why don't you teach the way these top freediving world records do it, right? Like, you're, why are you teaching different, clearly, methods that aren't, that don't work? And I say, are you a world record freediver? Well, no. Well, then you shouldn't breathe like one because what they do, they understand. They're trying to get that extra little bit of advantage, and they certainly get an advantage from doing that. But what, what happens? Because they start with more carbon dioxide, the contractions come way earlier. The dive becomes way more terrible, way more difficult. I have all these other things, right? So, yeah, if you're a world record free diver and your goal is to dive deep as humanly possible, you don't care how terrible you feel because you're going to train that out of it. But the, the average Joe, I mean, Ben, do you want your your 80 foot dives to feel harder than they were no. <laughs> than the way you did it. They were hard enough not. as it was. Right. It, exactly. So, you know, people have access to information on the internet and sometimes, you know, I would argue they don't uh, you know, understand how it's the most, most applicable. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you want yeah. a middle ground, which is what I teach. That was a, that was a gnarly adventure when we get, we got in the ocean. Remember like a, a tornado, but we were, yes. we had, yes, we had sharks circling around us that you showed us how to like point our, 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 I, I think you were, I, I, we weren't spear fishing, so you didn't have a gun, but you had like no, some kind of a no. long pole or object in your hand. You showed us how you could point it at it and the shark would go away. And then we had, so I, I like burst one of my eardrums still trying to learn friends. So I'm like bleeding. I didn't burst the eardrum, but I was bleeding out my nose. And I yeah. thought I'd like killed off half my brain. And then we finally get in the boat to go back. We're all shivering. We're starved. We, we've, we've gone through that rite of passage in the water. And then this like tornado blows in off the Fort Lauderdale coast. And we're like racing it in a boat to get back. I yes. mean, this stuff, that I was, mean, uh, pe un people, unusual trip. Yeah, but it was fun. Like, I don't want to scare people away, but it was, it was, it was actually pretty cool. It, it made my other dives feel easy. Well, I was I was just so ecstatic when you finally got <laughs> friends. Because the first two days you were stuck at fifteen feet, and I'm like, you oh, know, yeah. and I could tell like you were that close to being like, no, nah, I'm not coming out the third day. And I'm like, oh man, you. And then like the light bulb went off, and boom, right? You got it. Yeah, no, to to nail eighty feet, it, it felt good. I I can't fish at eighty feet, but it felt good to just be that deep in the water and know I'd I'd been that deep. Uh, so so how about uh, how free divers exercise? Like I remember you showed us, and I'd love for you to get into this. Like how you kind of exercise the diaphragm. You have like the number one stretch that you recommend for free divers. But are there any other things that like in the free diving community that people have kind of because you're very connected to that community uh, ways that people exercise 
exercise or ways that people stretch any typical like gym routines like what's the training protocol look like when you're out of the water well it's well you know like you look at most competitive free divers they're all going to be extremely fit right you know they're they're athletes so so that's that's not their they do whatever they do to 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 to, to get fit um but competitive free diving has this very weird thing right so certainly because we're athletes you want to have a high vo2 max just like almost any any athlete would right now high vo2 max comes with hard training which does what to our metabolism raises it right as a free diver do we want a high metabolism no, no. Like, we want the lowest no, that, that was why you wouldn't even let us drink a damn cup of coffee before we got up there <laughs> um so there's that you know there's that weird thing and i'll be honest we don't uh there's you know i don't know the perfect answer but the idea is you know so they might have you know if you're looking at training progression leading up to a competition there's going to be some point where they're going to be doing all your typical you know cardio however they want to do it right um and then as they're getting closer and closer to the event Right. They're going to be doing more apnea, more breath holding work. And then, you know, towards the end, maybe the last two weeks, they don't want they don't they're turning into a sloth. The only thing they're going to do is hold their breath on the couch. Right. Or maybe do some some workouts in the pool where, you know, they're trying to lower that uh, metabolism. So it's a very it is a very tricky thing to train at at a high level um, because I don't know of any of the sport where that's important, where, you know, you have those two competing issues. And the other thing that's, that's, that's tricky about it is <clears throat> there's not, we don't know the answer, right? Like if you want to become the, 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 if you're a U.S. speed skater and you're like, you know, top speed skater in high school, they just put you in some campus and there's a whole program and there's doctors and there's researchers and they just, they know how to make the best speed skater. They just put you through the program, right? We as freedivers, there's no money in the sport. So we don't have all of that. So we don't, not only we don't have that, we, we don't have that. And what we're trying to solve is incredibly complicated. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's it's uh, it's it's tricky. So so is there any type of gym routine or any type of like stretching routine or anything like that? Because uh, like you showed me that one stretch, and you know I'm curious. Yeah, so like the, when people go to the gym, are are they doing like high rep, low weight, low rep, high weight, or any insight into that? Most of the, in most circumstances, you know, you're not going to see big bulky free divers. Most circumstances. There are some that are actually pretty built that do right. very well. Goran Black, he's a, he's a big guy. Right. right? Um, uh, but most, right. Kind of you jokingly talked about was the, like, you know, the, the thin mild mannered free diver, right. They're going to be, um, you're going to see a lot in that way. Uh, if you're looking at this, the world record static guys that, that are doing the maximum breath holds, they are, they're very extremely skinny they're going to be not eating they're going to be fasting uh, um you know to to do everything they can to put themselves in starvation mode but i mean as far as you know typical gym training i don't think there's anything super special or particular to what they're doing most of them are going to most of them are just they want their good cardio but and they're not trying to bulk up on muscle so it's not, so it's almost like cycling where you know, a, a cyclist is going for a very good power to weight ratio, and and a lot of cyclists don't do a lot of strength training for that reason. At least traditional hypertrophic strength training. But you would you would you could make an argument that you want low amounts of muscle mass, but the muscle that you want would be like lean, wiry muscle that doesn't take up a lot of space, but that's very efficient metabolically. And in the areas that you need it, right? Like if you're yeah. doing, you know, if you're doing constant weight in the ocean, I mean, you don't, you're going to need some power in the quads to get yourself back up from two, 300, yeah. 400 feet, whatever you're coming from. I would say the biggest thing, the thing that, you know, they will all do um, is that idea of diaphragmatic stretching, right? Which is really, really critical. And so I can do a very quick exercise all your listeners can do to prove the power of that, that, that diaphragm. Okay. Okay, so all I'm going to ask them to do is just follow my instructions for just a bit. You're only going to have to hold your breath for 15, 20 seconds maximum, right? So the, the, I alluded to this earlier. Your, your physiologist will tell you that the, you know, the 80% of the urge to breathe comes from high carbon dioxide levels and 20% comes from low oxygen levels, right? So I always you know, start with that story in the class, and we're going to pretend that physiologist is sitting in the back, and he's going to be doing the same exercise with us, right? So here's the exercise we're all going to do together. So – 
you want to be sitting down. You want to make sure there's air, space in front of you. So if you were to you kind of bend down and put your head between your legs, you're not going to bonk onto anything. Mm-hmm. All right. So here's the deal. You're going to take pull, a big pull breath. over the car. <laughs> All right. So biggest breath you can. Now we're going to exhale the air out. All of it. You're going to bend over and push out every bit. Push, 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 push. Every bit, every bit, every bit, every bit. All out, all out. Now you're going to hold your breath, sit up, and we're going to hold our breath for 10, maybe 15 seconds. Keep holding your breath if you can. If you've already breathed, that's fine. All right. Five, four, three, two, one. Take a breath. Well, I got to pee. Right, you- there comes the pee. <laughs> right. So if you guys did that, you'd probably say that was one of the worst feelings that you've ever felt, especially if you actually exhaled all the air out. If you didn't exhale all the air, do it again. I promise you it'll, it'll be terrible. Now, let's look at what just happened there. 80% of the urge, the physiologist will tell you, 80% of the urge to breathe comes from CO2 and 20% comes from low oxygen. All right. So if I, and I've done this, I wrote an article in Spearing Magazine just recently, that's going to be coming out in a, in, a, in a month, actually a couple of weeks, about this exact same thing. And I, I used a uh, pulse oximeter in the middle of that exercise. So a pulse oximeter me- measures my oxygen level in my blood. And when I did that exercise, it started at 98%. And when I was done, it was 98%. So the oxygen level in my blood didn't alter at all, which means that the urge to breathe didn't come from oxygen. But that's we, we expected that because 20% comes from oxygen, 80% comes from carbon dioxide. So it must be the carbon dioxide. All right, so let's look at that. How is carbon dioxide created? It's created by consuming oxygen. Mm -hmm. How long do we hold our breath for? 15, 20 seconds. So that means we created 15 or 20 seconds worth of carbon dioxide. The exact same amount of carbon dioxide was created in that exercise than if you just held your breath for 15 seconds normally, where you would get no urge to breathe. So this means the low oxygen levels didn't trigger the urge to breathe, and the high carbon dioxide didn't trigger the urge to breathe because both of those are absolutely normal so now the physiologist in the back of the room is scratching his head like well why did i feel like i wanted to die (laughs) it's because i always say 80 percent urge to breathe comes from carbon dioxide 20 percent comes from low oxygen plus there's other factors as a free diving instructor i'll I'll put in that there's other factors and that's the diaphragm your diaphragm now unless you're a free diver whose trains or a competitive free diver you have never exhaled all the air out and then sat there, right? So your diaphragm got stretched in a way that it has never been stretched before. So in essence, as you exhale all that air out, your diaphragm, as your lungs shrink, your diaphragm gets sucked in to fill the void, right? So your diaphragm is getting sucked in up, 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 and it's a muscle, just like your hamstring. And it got stretched in a way that it has never been stretched before, right? So what it did, if you stretch your hamstring too far, you're going to get a signal that says back off, bit, quit bending forward, bend backwards, right? To loosen that that because the hamstring can't take it. When your diaphragm gets stretched too far, guess what it does? It says that's too far. So how would that diaphragm go back to normal if you took a breath? So it's triggering an urge to breathe to put your reset your diaphragm. So that urge to breathe in this particular example had nothing to do with your oxygen levels, had nothing to do with your CO2 levels, was completely triggered by the inflexibility of your diaphragm, right? So it's the inflexibility of the diaphragm that's causing that. That's also why as a free diver, if you have some, some of you that maybe have free diving experience, right? So like my students, you know, they're, they're free divers already. And I say, look, every student in my class has some depth where they go to. And they feel fine. Maybe it's 15 feet. Maybe it's 30, 40 feet. They get to the bottom. They feel no urge to breathe. They feel totally calm and relaxed. Every one of those students has a depth where you put 15 foot onto that, you know, 15 foot deeper. They get down there. They feel antsy. They feel uncomfortable. They, I got to get out of here. I can't handle this. I don't feel good. Well, why is that happening? It's because when they went down deeper, their lungs got compressed more. Their diaphragm got sucked into the point where it's, that's too much. I'm not comfortable with that level of stretch. And that's why it triggers that urge to breathe. That's why every competitive free diver on the planet stretches their diaphragm, right? Because it makes you more comfortable at depth, helps with equalization, does a lot of stuff. But um, it's that, it's that, that's something that most people 
you know, don't understand. And, you know, when I'm always talking to you, know, my typical student is a spear fisherman and they tend to want to poo poo on all this. They're like, I can bet it a free diving has nothing to do with spear fishing. I'm like, look, we dive really deep. We stay down a really long time. You should learn exactly how we do that and then do it for what you're doing. Yeah. Interesting. And by the way, returning back to the, uh, the piece about stretching the diaphragm, uh, I, I think that one other thing people should consider would be, uh, in many cases, there are like fascial adhesions, there's immobility in a lot of the muscles surrounding the diaphragm. Paul Check talks about this in some of his videos about like foam rolling the diaphragm. There are like, I, I have my massage therapist actually do massage therapy, uh, especially on either side of my rib cage, kind of, di- and you can do some of this yourself, like digging your fingers up underneath the rib cage while you're taking your breath. Mm-hmm. But you know, it, it's shocking to me how many people will get their IT bands massaged or their calves or their traps, but not do any work on the fascia that surrounds the abdomen and the diaphragm. So I think that that's a very important component. And the other thing that I wanted to bring up, returning back to the training was, you know what I think is probably the best form of training uh, that uh, that that someone interested in free diving could do? Uh, it's uh, it's the uh, I'll, I'll assume by your silence that you're just waiting with bated, I, 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 yeah, wait, yeah, waiting yeah, with bated breath. <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> pun intended. Uh, would be what Laird Hamilton does at his training pool, where he'll have a bunch of people over, and they do this ter- Tuesday, Thursday, and and Saturday in Malibu from like eight to eleven a.m. They've got a whole bunch of people over. Everybody's got a buddy. There's people monitoring the whole program, but you're in the water with dumbbells carrying the dumbbells back and forth under the water. You're swimming with, with the dumbbell, kind of like treading water with the dumbbell between your legs. You're doing jumps from the bottom of the pool while hoisting the dumbbell upwards. And, and you're basically doing an entire workout in the water. And what I like about that is Laird developed it for being able to survive the mental and physical rigors of being under the water for long periods of time when the, when the, when the surf kind of toes you under or you're, you know, you're thrown off your board and in the waves. And also what I like about it is you get this amazing cardiovascular and breath flow workout, but you're not sore the next day, meaning that you're not inducing muscle mass or hypertrophy. It's exhausting. You're cold. You're tired. You're hungry afterwards, just like a free diving session. And I think uh, I actually interviewed him. And in that interview with him, I, I linked to some articles with like samples of their workouts and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I was kind of thinking as you were talking about the diaphragm stretch, I'm like, well, gosh, I I think more free divers should know about the kind of stuff Laird's doing in his pool because, man, it not only is it a blast, but you're not sore. You're not building a bunch of muscle mass. But, I mean, you're, you're training blood and lungs tremendously. So I'll link to that in the show notes as well, my podcast with him. But I think that could be that could be a good way to go for some people. Yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure he went through the uh, the big wave surf program uh, that PFI does. Yeah, uh, where we where we go through all that sort of stuff. So Very cool. cool. Very cool. Well, I know we're, we're we're getting towards the end of the show, but I wanted you to to really uh, just walk us through quickly here the, the the different courses that you teach. Like I know you, I mentioned that you have one on breath holding. And these are like just courses people can go take online. Uh, you've got yep. one on the frenzel technique. What else do you have? So the, the one I'm, I'm honestly the most excited about is uh, I launched it uh, from the date of this recording four or five days ago um, is freedivingsafety.com. All right. So the idea of this course is it's a it's an online resource that teaches people, you know, safe freediving practices uh, from a trusted and reliable source. And it's free. Right. So the whole my whole thinking is this for the past 10 years, you know, I've been teaching these classes and you sat through my class. You I mean, you know, I'm passionate about freediving safety. Right. And the reason is there's 50 to 75 fatalities per year in the sport of, of freediving. Most seekers while spearfishing, but we're getting growing, growing number of people doing stuff in the pool because they saw some YouTube video, some guy telling them to do something in the pool, but they don't have safety. They don't understand. So, you know, for 10 years, I've been dealing with the spearfishing community. And what I always hear is, yeah, Ted, I, I love to take one of those courses. My boss, man, he's such a pain. In the, I, I can never get the time off or I can't afford the course. Right. So the way I look at it is if you want to get better at free diving, yeah, you're going to pay and take a course. It's like anything. If you want to learn how to be safe, if you want to learn to not kill yourself, I want you, you, you should, there's no barrier to that. Right. So the idea is uh, it's a, it's an online course. It's got basically an hour's worth of videos. Um, you're going to learn the, the rules, safe free diving practices. You're going to learn the myth of I don't push myself. I know my limits. I would know before I black out because the reality is. 
most circumstances you wouldn't. I have video footage of a spear fisherman with 30 years of experience. He's spear fishing at 50 feet, which is total normal depth for him. He did seven dives to that exact same depth. And you see him coming up from a dive and 10 feet from the surface. He has no idea what's wrong. He blacks out, he exhales all his air out, and you see him start to sink down. Now, the video recorder was a friend of mine and an instructor, Ren Chapman, you know, took care of him. He was fine. Uh, but I always am trying to get across this point that when you're diving in the ocean, people say, oh, I, I've never had a problem. I don't push myself. I'm not that worried about it. The, mecha- the, the physics of it is that on most dives in the ocean, if you were to have a blackout, you'd feel 100% fine the whole time. So saying that you don't push yourself, right? So it's going to explain that. And then it also has video. I hired two camera guys with multiple camera angles on what to do if you have a loss of motor control, what to do if you have a blackout at the surface, right? So I've, I've launched the courses for four or five days ago. I've already had 150 people in it. And, you know, people are the, the it's been, it's been, the response and, has been, been very good. And I'm very excited about and it. And that one's free diving safety.com safety. Okay. Yeah. I'll link to that in the show notes. And then you've got all these other courses, like how to make the mammalian dive reflex work for you and the spear fishing checklist, uh, the, the guide on how to mitigate the risks of free diving, the guide on equalizing the, the guide on taking a 30% bigger breath. I'll link to all of those so that you guys can, yeah. can just delve into all of Ted's knowledge. And that is all going to be over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash free diving podcast. That's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash free diving podcast. You got me excited, Ted, because I'm headed down to Kona to do some bow hunting next month. I'm going to throw in a couple of days of going after tasty fish. So thank you for, for opening me up to this whole world of free diving and spear fishing, man. You're you're my you're my guru in this department. No, oh, I, I, I enjoyed working with you, and I'm uh, excited to hear how the, the trip to Hawaii goes. And if you want any uh, suggestions for who to hook up with while you're there, definitely let me know. Sweet. All right, folks. Well, I'm Ben Greenfield, along with Ted Hardy, signing out from bengreenfieldfitness.com. Have an amazing week. Well, thanks for listening to today's show. You can grab all the show notes, the resources, pretty much everything that I mentioned over at bengreenfieldfitness.com, along with plenty of other goodies from me, including the highly helpful Ben Recommends page, which is a list of pretty much everything that I've ever recommended for hormones, sleep, digestion, fat loss, performance, and plenty more. Please also know that all the links, all the promo codes that I mentioned during this and every episode help to make this podcast happen and to generate income that enables me to keep bringing you this content every single week. So when you listen in, be sure to use the links in the show notes, use the promo codes that I generate because that helps to float this thing and keep it coming to you each and every week.